Uh, hi, today it's a typical winter January day in my land. Um, you can't really do gardening. Sometimes I plant trees in this weather. I take a spade and I'm bored and I just want to do something, so I just make holes in the snow and plant trees. But generally, not much gardening and walking. There's about a foot of snow. So I wanted to tell you about my hut. I live in a traditional Carpathian log cabin. Um, this kind of architecture is very typical for Eastern Europe and it's uh, dominant in much areas of Poland, Belarus, Ukraine and uh, a few other countries. So very similar to log cabins in America because people who came to America, they often came from uh, the Northern and Central Europe. So, um, and there was plenty of timber in America. Um, the material used in, in this area is the mainly fir, Abies alba, also pine trees, Pinus sylvestris, and higher up in the mountains, Pizza abies, uh, European nor spruce, Norway spruce. Um, so conifers, they were preferred because they, they were believed to be more durable um, against insects, but also quite straight, so it was easy to, um, you know, to build things for, 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 with them. The roof is quite slopy, it's above 50 degrees, but most houses in the area are 45 degrees now, and there are two sides of the roof. But before that, before 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all the houses had the, four, uh, the, the roofs had four, four sides because they were covered by thatch. But once people stopped using thatch, they started making these, um, you know, side walls with, with boards, so the, the structure of the roof changed a bit. And um, in some parts of my area, the, the roof has like two, uh, two parts. One is very sharp and also at the end is a bit like pagoda, yeah? It kind of bends. You can see how it's, um, how it's uh, created by uh, adding extra pieces of wood at a different angle. So, um, so it looks nicer. And also gives you a nice kind of like a like a shade area around the house, shading you from wind, and also you can store you can store some um, some wood here. Uh, the size of logs. So the wall here in this area is usually 18 centimeters across, but in some areas of Poland it was only 12 or 16 if people were poorer. Today temperature is plus one, snow is melting. In winter, most winter days, temperatures range between plus five to minus ten. Rarely, but sometimes occasionally going down to minus twenty or even uh, more, but it's only like a couple of days a year. Most days it's around zero. Uh, but often very windy here, so also wind is a problem. Um, so these houses were quite warm and people in these areas or people who couldn't afford these uh, thick logs, if they had logs only 12 or 14 centimeters across, they would do something which was called gacenie. They would make like a structure around the house and put lots of leaves. Um, um, you know, when they, if there were windows, they would go up to the windows, but in some, some places of the house, they could even go up to two meters. And this would protect extra uh, the house from uh, from cold. What about um, the spaces between logs, the chinking? Uh, you can see from these holes here that is, they, it's made of moss, and moss was traditionally used in most parts of Poland, uh, and then it was covered on both sides with, with clay, with other materials mixed in. Um, these holes came out because... Um, I didn't see, I store wood here and probably some birds, usually birds steal moss, so I have to fill it back. But actually, I did this chinking about 12 years ago, and only once I had to just do it, so I'll do it this year. So this was about one or two hours work every six years, and actually most of the clay work is keeping very, very well. If you look inside the house, some of the walls are plastered with natural clay, covered with white clay, very thin layer, but most of it is just yellow clay, and which is not traditional, which is more like a, a modern eco thing. 
but and some of the wolves I left um, I left bare. The ones which the ones from the side of the wind are covered by clay to make extra insulation, and these not. So you can see the section. Let's look at the section here. Um, moss is packed really tight, and inside the house, this is not traditional. I use gypsum and I put like a a metal mesh uh, for uh, joining uh, gypsum panels, modern panels. You can buy it in any uh, DIY shop, and then normal elastic gypsum for you know insulating these little bits. If you do. Uh, my modern house as well, and this keeps for 15 years in one of the houses I um, I was supervising 15 years um, and this 12 years or even 13 years no problem not a single centimeter of gypsum came off. Um, this this um, this wall is uh, from wood which was cut in my forest. This is pine wood, new wood. People, when they were making wood, they were avoiding um, um, size of branches because they were going to bring bad luck. So it was best if the wood was like without without it, just like this, just straight. And this year I wrote a paper about moss chinking in, in my area with my colleagues Witek and Agnieszka. And it's published in a in an ethnographic journal in Polish, but it's available open access online, and you can download the PDF and you can Google translate it, and it will be easy to understand. So you can see the um, on the side you can see the, the the link to to the article. In the photo, you can see my master uh, Franciszek Kaszyk from my village from from Rzepnik, who was teaching me how to make moss insulations and in the photo you can see this characteristic tool it's called trusło in polish it's a side part of a plow which is used for cutting off pieces of earth so this part was used for like packing like um, you know pressing the the moss here is a photo from 1930s from this article where you can see um, a group of women uh, raking moss from the forest. So this was women's activity. They would go to, to pastures or uh, forest to gather moss and some old women would be like specializing in collecting moss and that's how they make money. Then they would sell it to particular buyers or even maybe sell it in the market. So um, which mosses are here? I can't really tell exactly because I'm not a bryologist, but um, from Mr. Kashik showed me and from a few other people who explained how to collect moss and uh, what they showed, I identified that they would prefer a moss called Ritidiadelphus squarosus, which often grows in moist pastures. And also you could use a moss growing in pine woods called um, Entodon shreberi or Pleurotium shreberi, or... Um, you know, other kind of fluffy, gentle mosses. I'm not sure about sphagnums, but probably you could use them as well. What they said, you cannot use the hard mosses. By hard mosses, they meant mosses like Polytrichum, Polytrichastrum, like Atrichum, and like Leucobrium. So if it's, if it's too short, it's also not, if it's too big or too short, it's not, it's not good. It should be kind of soft. Anything which is soft. And, uh, for this house, I used 40 rubbish bags, 40 large, maybe um, 50 or 100 liter bags of for rubbish, uh, 40 bags, so quite a lot. Um, in Poland, it's actually illegal to um, collect mosses from state forests. You have to ask the permission. You can get the permission from Forestry Commission. You can also collected from private forests if the, the owner lets you do it. Um, so, you know, I have my forest, so I collected a lot of them just in my forest or in the local cemetery, um, in things like meadows as well. Um, this was a very magic experience, actually. Um, so when you gather the moss, it's very important to make it completely dry. And also it's good to actually collect it when it's dry. 
because then it's less work with with actually um, with actually you know drying it. So um, once you have it completely dried, you can dry it in the attic, for example, in in, in thin layers. Um, you can keep it forever for a century, uh, and you can just when before uh, chinking, just spread it on the floor and sprinkle with water a little bit to give it some elasticity. This is a very important stage in moss chinking. Uh, you have to remember that moss chinking is very durable. Uh, it can last for a few centuries, and also the insulation properties are like, you know, the best modern materials, and uh, it's completely ecological, completely pure. The size of uh, of the space between logs is very, very important. My master, Mr. Noga, Mr. Stanisław Noga, wonderful man who died a few years ago, who made this house, um, told me that it has to be uh, about five centimeters. He said, like, like two fingers. Um, uh, he said uh, he was quite rude. He actually compared it to some female parts, and you said you just only can put two fingers. Um, and um, I made it a bit tighter. I made it one finger, and he was very angry. Then the guy who uh, who was drinking said, oh, it's so difficult because it has to be just two fingers. So why why two fingers? Because um, then it's very easy to operate with the, uh, with the chinking tool, with the chusuo. And if you make it tighter, then the metal bar is difficult to, to go in. And also the log set. So once you make the house and then you come back after three or four months, you see that the the space is actually because it kind of went down a bit. It's unavoidable, depending on the structure of the house. Of course, uh, this uh, this change of, of um, space between logs changes. And you can, of course, block it a bit, but it's still always a problem. So when you make a house, it's best to make the moss the same time as you make the house so that you do the chinking straight after making the structure. Don't make it for... Uh, don't make it too long. And um, and also, what was outside? So outside is clay. It should be like clay with a bit of sand, like uh, not too fat, uh, quite light. Uh, and you would add some perfect. In my, in my area, it's perfect for making clay structures, so I don't have to do anything. I just added some uh, wood fibers. You can add like chaff. Some plant material which makes it, which 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 ties the clay together, so then it doesn't crack, doesn't doesn't break. There are some cracks, but they're just minor cracks. And in some places between the logs, I put um, nails to extra stabilize it. But uh, or very often you don't even need it. And this was done 12 years ago, also by my um, like four or five year old daughter, and um, it's it's all it's all staying. And actually, I learned this technique when I was four years old. My auntie Marisha would go around the house where we lived with me, and I would help her. So I actually mastered it at the age of four. And and at the end, I would like to say that I dedicate this uh, video to my two uh, wood architecture masters, Mr. Stanisław Noga from Wysoka Strzyżowska, who made this beautiful house. And he had such good energy. He was a really honest, wonderful man. And he also did some magic making this house. For example, we had to put four coins on the corners of the house. And one coin was a Polish złoty. On one corner, I put the British pound. On another, a French euro. And on another, a German euro. And he never uh, he never sw uh, sweared during making the, the house because it's bad luck if the master who makes it says like bad things, like curses, I won't say, but uh, you can't do it. Uh, and also, I would like to thank also the deceased uh, uh, Frederik Kaszyk, my neighbor, who told me how to chink houses. And we actually uh, chinked two houses together, this one, and also my, my friend Tom's, the house in Pietrusza Wola, number 50. Now he has... Um, and Airbnb there, and you can you can look at look up the website also, and and you can stay there. And um, also, um, he also did some more chinking for my friends, so because he was like the last master in this area. And just uh, one more thing: what happens if you don't have enough moss? 
you can mix some hay, but it has to be very special hay. It has to be hay from second cutting, so you wouldn't uh, take it from June or July first cutting because it's too uh, breaky, too crumbly, and it's it, it, co it contains too much protein, not enough fiber. And then if you cut the meadow second time, the, the grass blades are shorter. It's usually like a gross tease. It's from poor land. You have to be like, you know, very small grass from poor land, like a gross tease, like festuca. And um, and then you um, then you can also mix it with moss or even do it with just with the grass. Uh, many people who make uh, wooden houses in in Poland now they they use other materials for chinking like some kind of cannabis threads or you know um, uh, some kind of wood shavings, but they are not as good as moss. And the reason why people don't use moss now is because. It is illegal to collect it in state forests without permission. So if you live in Poland and you want to restore this, such a house or build a new one, uh, I would I suggest you to ask for permission. It's not difficult to get it. You can actually ask the permission and then you can just legally go to the forest and collect collect the moss. Um, also, it's not difficult to collect it illegally because it's no one really checks until, until you are very obvious and, you know, you come with a la large car and lots of bags, etc. Uh, in the past in Poland, we had much more moss in the, moss in the forests. It's because um, forests were more, there were more conifers in the forest. Now we tend to promote the native deciduous trees. And also there was a lot of uh, grazing, so there was a lot of moss around the forest, also in open forests. Um, there w uh, the, the grass wasn't so tall, and uh, old people from this village told me that uh, mm, uh, there was a lot of this Ritidia delphus moss everywhere. It was very easy to just take take rake, and, and also uh, cows wouldn't like it, so... You, it was very good for pasture to, to actually rake it off and then use it for the housing. So it was all synerging. The old um, economy was about using the weeds in some crops for other purposes. So, for example, uh, you would collect Kinopodium album uh, goosefoot, which was a weed in potatoes, but it was edible by itself. You would collect moss in meadows, which was a weed for meadows, and then you would utilize it for house chinking. You would collect Origanum uh, vulgare or Artostaphylos, uh, which were, you know, growing in uh, pastures were not eaten by cows or Lycopodium, the, the club, club mosses, but they were used for natural dyeing, for make, for coloring textiles. So, um, so this was all very synergic and we are completely losing it. So one of my aims is actually to go back to this life and I actually have more synergy in my life. And it often means you don't do things on large scale. Yeah, you just, you just have a house, you have a garden, you have a piece of forest, and you try to figure out what to do with it, how to utilize it, how to utilize every bit of the forest. You cannot see, but um, on the other side of the hill there, there is a clay house which was built in 1940s after the Second World War, and the structure was made from blackthorn, from Prunus spinosa, which everyone thinks is a complete weed and a completely useless plant. But here, people would really appreciate this tree because it was very good for all these wattle and daub, you know, clay structures because it has a lot of sharp branches and it really stabilizes clay very well. So sometimes a terrible weed can become... Uh, a blessing for another person or in another circumstance. So let's have more synergy in life, all of us. Uh, just one more thing I forgot to mention. Most of the wood in this house is recycled and it was uh, it is from a log cabin which was built in 1857 which was taken apart, was going to be burned for firewood and I rescued it for at that time, two hundred pounds or two hundred dollars in in the beginning of the twenty first century, and uh, I just um, used the new wood for the base of the house, so like this log at the bottom, and for like this bit, and also for the roof, for the top bit, 
and for one of the wolves. The rest is old. The rest is um, over uh, over a hundred and sixty years old. <laughs>